So hello everybody, I welcome you to our webinar today, Correction Models for XRF. My name is Rainer Schramm and I would like to guide you today um, through the different models we can use uh, to do corrections in the XRF analysis. In my last webinar, um, a few months ago, I described you standardless software with examples and how you can use it. And um, there was a lot of feedback from your side. And um, the resume was that you would like to know more about correction models. And this is why this webinar today takes place. And however, the idea to explain everything in one webinar is of course difficult to get everything in 30 minutes. So I decided to present you today a complete overview of all correction models which I use nowadays. And then there will be another webinar in September when I um, present how to use it with examples and advantages and disadvantages and so on. Yeah, it was not possible to squeeze everything here in one webinar. So that's why today it's a bit theoretic and I hope um, you, you are able to follow me and, and if not, please send me questions afterwards. I'm always willing to help you to understand. Also, you can write any kind of questions in the chat. If possible, I answer through the presentation and otherwise at the end or even later on if, if it's too complex. Okay, so let's go. Um, I will first start to explain what is XRF shortly so that we understand where our intensity is coming from. Um, then uh, we discuss very simple how we make the first calibration, um, the first simple empirical correction. So empirical here always means based on standard materials. Then we make a matrix correction based on standards. Then we try to do the matrix correction based on theory. And last but not least, um, I complete the presentation by the uh, theoretical model of fundamental parameters, which I presented already in the last webinar. So how to create X-ray fluorescence? You always have an excitation of your elements by an X-ray tube, for example. This will uh, create some gaps on the inner shells and um, electrons from higher shells will fill that gap and while filling it um, the energy difference uh, could be sent out as fluorescence radiation and we distinguish between different kind of fluorescence radiation depending on in which shell the gap has occurred yeah? so a different way to show it would be that we have here our inner shell k which is called k shell then we have the L shells and the M shells. And if, for example, in the K shell, a gap is produced and an electron from the L shell is filling it, we call the lines we see K alpha. If it's coming from the M shell, it would be K beta. And um, also in the L shell, gaps will be filled from the M shell. And then we get an L line pattern. But how does this look like? A typical spectrum. Um, will look like this for the K lines, and this is the example for iron. We would see such a line pattern, a K alpha line and a K beta line, um, difference around factor five between the lines. And if we look on an L pattern, like here from platinum, we will see these four peaks in different um, peak heights, which then defines a typical L pattern. What you also should know is that the intensity in energy dispersive XRF comes from the area, the surface of the peak, and in wavelength dispersive, it comes from the height of the peak. Both we call intensity, and for both, all following models are the same. So there is no difference between the two technologies. Okay, so the first way we would do a calibration in analytical chemistry is that we, we use the x-axis for concentration and the y-axis for intensity. We will put our measuring data there and with a linear regression we will try to fit a line into our cloud of points. But in x-ray already we have one difference. 
we try to use a different uh, presentation so the intensity and the concentrations are exchanged. So we use the intensity on the xx and the concentration on the y and um, then uh, make our linear fit. Um, this has to do that all the models we are using um, are working on base of this presentation. Yeah, so our intensity has a function which then results in concentration and the easiest way is that we determine the slope of this um, of this linear line and this is our sensitivity then between intensity and concentration. So then the first increase would be that we also introduce an offset and the offset means in XRF it's like a blank value. Yeah? And um, so then the formula becomes like this, that we have our measured intensity, we have our slope, the sensitivity, and um, then we add um, our offset, which has the unit concentration, and this is why it is representing also like a blank value. So easily in a calibration, you could change the blank value um, just to shift around your calibration. In some rare cases, we could also see a quadratic um, dependency. Um, for example, if you have a constant matrix like a liquid and you have a trace element inside this liquid and the trace element is getting higher and higher in concentration, we will see that there starts some self-absorption and then um, the relationship becomes quadratic. Um, however, um, this is one of the only exceptions where I would say you can use it. In all the other cases, you should not use quadratic, um, ter quadratic calibration curves. Remain linear, and whatever curves your line is a matrix correction, and this for this we have better models in XRF you should use. And this comes to the point that I have to explain you what is a matrix effect. And the first example would be excitation. So let us assume you have a sample with chromium as element, and the chromium will be excited by, unser, by our X-ray tube, and this will create then uh, a chromium fluorescence radiation, which then will be um, red registered by our detector. So this will result in a normal peak, like you see here. But now we have a second element in this sample, like iron. Iron is an element with higher atomic number, and it's at as high that it's uh, able to excite also chromium. That means the fluorescence iron radiation is not only sent out of the sample, it's also used partly to excite, excite uh, chromium. And this results in a higher chromium intensity than it would be without the iron. Yeah? So here we have a kind of a secondary excitation, which will increase our signal without changing the concentration of chromium in the sample. The same would be opposite. If we have an absorption, that means that beside chromium, our element, we have an element like titanium, lower atomic number than chromium, and as low that titanium is able to absorb chromium fluorescence radiation. And this means that a part of the chromium radiation is used to excite titanium. And this results in a lower chromium peak. So here you see already the two important effects. In one case, our chromium signal is higher than expected, and in the other case, it's lower than expected. And this we call matrix effect. So this means in our calibration, we will have points where there is no matrix effects, and so they are exactly on the line. And then we will have points where we have an absorption, so the intensity is too low, and others are excited, so the intensity is too high. And um, we need now a correction to get these points on the line. That is the whole idea of matrix correction in XRF. And you see our familiar formula, where we had so far the intensity, the measured one, with the slope and the blank value. And now we introduce here a factor for the matrix correction. And this means that this factor has 
to correct the intensity in a way that it comes to the line. So in the case of um, titanium, where the chromium was too low, we have to increase the intensity. So this means this M must be higher than one. And in the case of iron, we have um, too much intensity. In this case, we have to reduce our intensity, so the factor will be below one. And this is the whole story of matrix correction. There is a model called Lucas, Tooth, and Price, and this is exactly doing this. So now this M becomes this formula here, and this formula is nothing else than a factor. A factor which is around one. If it's exactly one, we have no matrix correction. So it is not necessary to do any corrections, like in these cases. If we have these cases, then we need here a correction. And therefore, the disturbing elements are introduced. So that means the intensity of iron, which um, excites the chromium, or titanium, which absorbs the chromium, is introduced. That means we measure also iron and titanium. And then there is a factor calculated to get these two factors either higher than one or lower than one. And um, this is done based on standard materials. And this is also a very important fact that if you do such a matrix correction, your set of standard materials has to represent this effect. So you need um, some samples without matrix effect, and you need others which show extremely that effect so that the mathematics are able to calculate these correction factors um, to do then the matrix correction for your application. So I just repeat the same formula from Lucas, Tooth, and Price, but now instead of using the intensity to correct for the other elements, we can also use the concentration. And this would be a model called, for example, La Chance Trail. Yeah, so here now we use the concentrations, and this has an advantage, because when you use concentration, they are already corrected for the matrix effect. Okay, now you see there is a bit um, a strange situation, because in the beginning, we don't know the concentration. So what we do is that um, in the first estimation, um, the concentration is calculated without matrix correction for every element in our sample. And then when we know the concentrations, we can do our first matrix corrections. And then we get new concentrations. And this way, in an iteration, step by step, we will approach to the final concentrations, um, which are then fully matrix corrected. I would always prefer a concentration-based correction model because the matrix effects are already included, while intensity-based models is just without any, any matrix correction for the other elements, has, however, the advantage that you don't need to calibrate every element. So you could use other elements where you just know the intensity but no concentration, and you still can use them for matrix correction of the element of interest. But again, all this is based on standard samples, and you have to be, uh, you have to make sure that your standard samples are presenting these effects, so that the mathematics are able to calculate the coefficients. So there would be another possibility to do an empirical uh, matrix correction. This is if you want to use the scattering of your exciting X-rays. So let us assume we have our sample, and the sample is irradiated by our X-ray tube. The X-ray tube is issuing a spectra more or less like this. So we have our continuous Bremsstrahlung, and we have our characteristic lines from the anode material of the tube. And then this radiation is just scattered at the sample. So we are not talking here about fluorescence radiation. It is only the exciting radiation which is scattered at the sample, and there is a part which comes to the detector, and then the detector will um, register the intensities of these um, exciting um, radiation like this. So if this would be a molybdenum tube, we will have our molybdenum characteristic lines, which are issued by the tube and scattered by the sample, 
And the first scattering is a Rayleigh scattering. So we see exactly the molybdenum ka alpha and molybdenum ka beta, which are these two as well, are scattered at the sample. But there are two other peaks, and this is Compton scattering. That means this uh, molybdenum ka alpha radiation had an interaction with the sample and lost some energy. And this is why at a lower energy, there is another peak. Origin is also molybdenum ka alpha, or in this case, molybdenum ka beta. And um, this peak um, is the Compton peak of molybdenum ka alpha. And the interesting point here is that the scattering effect is directly correlating with the sample um, composition. So that means uh, the elements of the samples make different scattering. So this peak will always represent what elements in total are in this sample. And this means that we can use that peak like an internal standard to correct for the whole sample, so for the matrix effect of the whole sample. And this is an example. I have here um, two materials, polyethylene and ABS, so two polymers, and in total three samples. And you can see how the scattering signal is varying depending on the sample. And to see now the matrix effect, um, I need to normalize these spectra to the Rayleigh peak. And this would then look like this. And then you see that the two PE samples have more or less the same Compton peak and the ABS has a different. So that means if you would take the intensities of your trace elements in such a polymer and you just divide it by this peak, you make a kind of matrix correction and you could calibrate elements in RBS together with elements in PE. Yeah, so this is not possible for all kinds of applications, but it is the first approach to do um, some empirical matrix correction. And like I told you in, in the next webinar, I will give you then more examples to go deeper into when you can use it and why not. Again, this has to be calibrated classically with standard materials. So now let us come to the point that I don't want to use standard materials to calculate this M. I want to do, let it do the software. And this means that we use fundamental parameters to calculate this M. And the standard materials I'm using is only to get the slope and the blank value for my calibration. And there would be the model Lachance trail. And instead of, I, uh, of our coefficient a i j, now I call it alpha i j. That's the only difference of the last formula. And then um, because you might know it better as alpha correction models. And um, this is why we, we just have changed here the term a bit. And then, um, but it's exactly the same formula than before. But now with the idea that our coefficient is not calculated by standard materials, that this time the coefficient is calculated from tables. And how do we do that? Um, we could use the mass absorption coefficients, which are um, listed in tables, to calculate this um, alpha. And what does this mean? So the mass absorption coefficient is um, a combination of how many chromium is excited in the sample from the exciting beam of the X-ray tube, and how many fluorescence radiation is able to leave through the sample to reach the detector. Yeah? So two effects in combination. And this is first um, looked, uh, observed for the element of interest. And then, of course, we have to do this for all the elements which disturb um, our chromium intensity, either by exciting it more or absorbing it. And um, having both together, we could calculate our um, alpha coefficient. And in this way, we can do the matrix correction for all disturbing elements in this samples. Important, when we do it like this, we, we uh, call this like constant alpha correction. And we need to define a typical sample for that. That means um, the concentration is more or less the same for all samples. And this means also that the correction is only valid for this uh, mean uh, concentration sample or the typical sample. You have to specify it for this model. In the moment you get different samples, 
which are getting far away from this one, um, then the model is not working so properly. But we call this theoretical correction is constant alpha. But now, if we want to have the correction model for the whole concentration range, then we need to work with variable alphas. And how does this work? This works in the way that the software is calculating for the whole concentration range of my elements. So if we look, if we look at chromium, and we say from 0 to 100%, I want to have a matrix correction, then with three alpha coefficients, there is a curve calculated, which then over the whole um, concentration range is calculating what matrix corrections I need for my disturbing element. Yeah. And if I compare this to the other model with the constant alpha, you see that both models will go together at the typical concentration I put for the constant alpha, this would be here at 50%, and only there I get the same result. While if I go far, far away from it, then of course the COLA model will fit much better than this uh, constant alpha model. Yeah. But both together have the idea that you use the fundamental parameter approach to calculate your alpha coefficients, and in this way, you don't need standard materials to calculate a matrix correction. You still need standards to get the slope and the blank value. So last but not least, um, we come to the real use of fundamental parameters by calculating the whole approach. That means we describe everything between concentration and intensity by the theoretical approach, by the Sherman equation, and um, that means, in theory, no standard material is used. Um, in the real world, I would always use some standard materials, at least to get the sensitivity of the spectrometer and um, also to verify the model. But from the theory side, no standard material is used if, if all conditions of this model is fulfilled. In the last webinar, I described to you how this is used. So now I just want to present it to complete this overview of um, the correction models. You could also extend the fundamental parameters by now using also here the Compton correction. So how is this possible? I told you that the scattering of the Compton is depending on the whole sample. And then what could be done is an empirical calibration between this Compton peak with a lot of standard materials to the mass absorption coefficients of the whole sample at the Compton energy line. And this, is, this was described already a long time ago. So in this way, you could then better describe the mass absorption coefficients in this um, fundamental parameter equation. And in this way, also to include uh, elements you can't measure. So if you have, for example, a polymer matrix, or a water-based matrix or an oil-based. Yeah? So in this way, you can, can complete the theoretical model and then in the end analyze all kinds of materials, even if the matrix can't be measured. Yeah? So sometimes this is also called a dark matrix or the yeah, not measurable part of the matrix. OK, um, let's summarize now this whole overview of correction models. So if you do XRF analysis, um, first of all, you can work without any correction. If you have a simple matrix, you have just a few traces. So you will always um, establish a linear approach where you have the blank value and where, where you have your sensitivity, a slope, and then you are done. But if you need a correction, because there are other elements which are disturbing, uh, your calibration element, then you have different choices. First of all, you could go just for a standardless approach, like we have it nowadays in all different kind of X-ray spectrometer software packages, and um, just use that to let describe your sample, and you get the first a quantitative analysis. And this could be also combined with the content scattering approach, so that even the non measurable elements could be um, analyzed as matrix part. Yeah? Um, 
On the other side, we have a pure empiric um, matrix correction, and there the simplest way would be to use just a Compton peak. So your intensity is just divided by the Compton intensity, and in this way you make a first sample matrix correction. Or you just want to do a real matrix correction, and this could be then based either on the theoretical approach, that means you let calculate your matrix correction based on the fundamental parameters, or you use standard materials to calibrate your matrix correction. And there we have the two models, concentration-based or intensity-based, but what I told you, I always rec recommend to use concentration-based models because they have a much better performance um, in doing matrix correction. Be always careful that you only include uh, matrix correction from elements where the concentration is significantly high and where your standard set is really representing these kind of corrections. If not, you get an overcorrected model and then um, you, your results um, may go wrong. If we see the theoretical part, so you let calculate the M, the matrix correction from the fundamental parameters, then um, you could either work with variable alphas. This makes sense, for example, if you have a metal application, if you have big concentration variations, and therefore your matrix correction must be different for every sample. Or if your matrix is very constant, you could use just constant alphas. This, for example, is used quite often in a few speed application because this is good enough to do the other correction. So this in the end is the whole table of uh, matrix correction in XRF. And like I told you on the 6th of September, I will then step deeper into this part. This we made already in the last webinar, but on the right side, I will give you then more examples, pros and cons, where, when to use which uh, model so that you get a better feeling on um, when to use what. And also, it's probably good to know um, how your model is called and yeah, what you are using really in your XRF software. So here's some literature um, where you can also get more details. And last but not least here, I'm just um, telling you on the Fluxamina uh, platform, we also have more courses where you can find um, these kind of uh, explanations. And I already would like to announce the next webinar, which is in July, which is a, a real practical one without many formulas. And um, for iron ores, um, for XRF analysis. Okay, at this point, thank you very much. And now um, I'm curious to your questions here. So let me see in the, in the question and answers. Um, someone is asking here, if I have an element with 7% maximum calibration, do you recommend car alpha line or, I can't read it really, it's a car alpha M line or car alpha M line? Um, ah, now I understand. It's the car alpha major line or the car alpha minor line. The car alpha major and minor is depending on what excitation conditions you are using. I think this must be um, from the expert software, from the expert in the software, which asks you what kind of uh, excitation conditions you want. Major means it's a high line, minor means it's a, a lower line, and so that means the line overlap conditions are selected. In the end, it doesn't matter if you choose the right excitation conditions. I hope that helps. Next question, if I have a sample with low Compton ratio, how can I increase it to 100%? So Compton ratio means Compton to Rayleigh ratio. If this is low, it means you have very little scattering and then this kind of uh, correction comes to a limit. Yeah? So you have to see if the Compton scattering really is independent on your sample, on your element concentrations. 
and you have to try out if you can use it. Yeah, probably you can only find it out by by testing it. For the content scattering, it's important that the line, if the line is very close to the Compton line, it works very well. As far away the line is, as less it works, and if there's an absorption edge in between also, this will disturb the ratio, and in this way, um, it could be that it's not working anymore. Another question here between different brands of XRF for same correction method, the co coferent, the coefficient is the same or different. Um, if you talk about the alpha corrections, then in the alpha, sometimes the concentrations are included. So it could be that they are about a factor thousand different. So this could happen. But in the end, if the origin is um, fundamental parameters, they should be more or less the same. So then there's another question, could XRF, could EDXRF use these correction methods? Yeah, so the correction methods are independent on energy dispersive or wavelengths dispersing if XRF. Yeah, there is no difference um, what technique you're using. In the end, we have an intensity and we are looking for a concentration and uh, effect between both is fluorescence, X-ray fluorescence, and this is just described by the same theory. Now, there's no difference between energy and wavelengths dispersive. So any more questions? Oops. Um, no. Yeah, if this were all questions, I would like to thank you for joining my webinar. And um, if there are more questions or you, you want to have some better explanations, just send me an email. I'm always willing to get into discussion with you. Um, and, and perhaps also if you have some ideas, suggestions for the next webinar, so some examples um, for, for the practical use of the correction models, I always would appreciate it. There's a last question here. If the XRF manufacturer did not install the correction in advance, could we use it? You could use it if the software is offering it to you. Yeah. So if the mathematical model is there, then if it's empiric, you have to use some standard materials to calculate the factors. If it's theoretic, you just use it and you should validate it with some standards to see if it works correctly. Okay, thank you very much and see you again in our next webinar. Bye-bye.